Hello everyone, it is rainy outside tonight, but we are comfortably seated inside in my library. It is warm, it is cozy, and it is time for more mystery stories. I'm going to tell you about three new stories tonight to entertain you, relax you or lull you to sleep. First, we will follow the Donner Party, an expedition of dozens of pioneers on their way to California in the 1840s. They got lost and trapped in the mountains of the Sierra Nevada and had to survive for months until they were rescued. The fate of the Donner Party is actually not really a historical mystery, in the sense that what happened is well known, but it will give us the opportunity to talk about the American Far West in the 19th century, when waves after waves of migrants settled the Middle West and the Pacific Coast. After that, Our second story of the night will be about Oak Island, a small island in Nova Scotia, Canada, that is known for various theories, various stories about buried treasures and historical artifacts, and has attracted treasure hunters for a very long time. And finally, Our third story will be about the Bermuda Triangle, a region of the Atlantic Ocean that acquired a mysterious reputation for the disappearance of ships and aircraft. We'll see where it comes from and what this was based on. The first story about the Donner Party may be a bit sinister. It didn't end well, so if you find it too dark, you may want to go straight to the second story. There are timestamps in the first comment pinned under the video to help you navigate it easily. In the same comment, you will find links to my Patreon page if you wish to support the channel and contribute to keep it free of video ads and also to audio streaming platforms like Spotify, Apple Music or Amazon Music where you can also listen to my stories. I have made several playlists by theme on Spotify and some people find it more convenient. In any case, Feel free to close your eyes at any time during these stories. You don't need any visuals to follow them. And you will only need the sound of my voice to be immersed and guided through these journeys to the past. Now take a deep breath. Relax. The sweet sound of the rain has gone for now that it will be back to lull you to sleep once we are done with the stories. And now, let's begin. In the spring of 1846, a group of almost 90 emigrants left Springfield, Illinois and headed west to California. At the time, the United States was still very much a young country that looked very different from what it is now. Sixty years after its independence, the country covered just the eastern half of its modern territory, with its frontier reaching Missouri, Arkansas and Texas. Beyond these were claimed territories, including a large part of the Middle West, 
that the U.S. had bought from France in 1803, the Louisiana Purchase. But for the most part, these lands were not organized by the U.S. government yet. The states on the East Coast, around the Mississippi, up to Michigan in the North, plus Texas, existed. But the rest of the modern United States was still territories or belonged to other countries, especially California, Nevada, Arizona, Utah, or New Mexico, that belonged to the also recently independent state of Mexico. Like for the US in the Middle West or the Northwest, these were more claims than actual possessions at this point because they were mostly empty of Mexican administration, but not empty of people. The population was scarce given the distances, but there were numerous Native American tribes that had lived on these lands for generations. In the 1840s, all of these frontiers were moving fast, and the US government was more willing than ever to expand in North America to reach the Pacific. Texas had separated from Mexico and become an independent republic which lasted for 10 years until it was annexed in 1845 as the 28th state. And just a few months after the departure of our group to the West in 1846, the war with Mexico started that ended in the annexation by the United States of a big chunk of its current territory in the southwest. But beyond the maps, the human reality of it was a growing flow of settlers who left their homes in the east to resettle in the west, either in the Midwest in the Great Plains or all the way to California, or the Oregon Territory, which was a large area in the northwest disputed with Great Britain, that later became the states of Oregon, Washington, Idaho, and parts of Wyoming and Montana. In order to reach the west coast, there were two possible routes, by the sea, but the distances were enormous. The Panama Canal did not exist yet, so ships had to sail from the east coast to the very south of America, enter the Pacific, and then make another very long leg north along the Pacific coast. In total, this journey by the sea was about 15,000 miles, the equivalent to more than half the circumference of the Earth. Or the alternative that most settlers chose because it was not much slower and way more affordable was by land. The journey was long and dangerous, but immigrants were motivated by several things. Economic opportunities, such as the promise of owning land and improving their living conditions and social status. Freedom, because American society, cities and communities in the East and the South had already been established for several generations, and opportunities for newcomers to find their place or live like they wished were not always available. For example, many religious communities emigrated to the West during this period. Yet another motivation could be the willingness to escape legal or financial trouble. Disappearing into the Wild West was the perfect opportunity to start over and never have to face the problems of a previous life. Immigrants in the United States in the 19th century could be very mobile and relocate several times. 
the Donner Party is an example of this. It is called the Donner after two brothers. George Donner, who was 60 in 1846 and who had gradually moved west in his life. He was born in North Carolina and moved to uh, Kentucky, Indiana, and finally Illinois. He was accompanied by his wife and several children. His younger brother, Jacob, also joined the party with uh, his wife and children and employees like teamsters and handymen. The two brothers were joined by another family, the Reeds, headed by James Reed, who expected to leave financial worries behind by disappearing in the Wild West. And he also expected the warm climate of California to help his wife, who suffered from poor health. It was common for immigrants to form wagon trains and travel together for the entire journey or parts of it. Some of them were poor, but not all of them. They carried a few possessions and sometimes gold or silver that they would spend to settle once arrived at their destination or to buy help and equipment on the way. And this was the case here. The donors were relatively wealthy. The Reeds too had enough resources to hire help and they started their travel with nine wagons for 32 family members and employees. Other families that would join them later along the way had similar profiles. Some were poorer, but most traveled with possessions and animals, especially oxen. Now let's take a look at these covered wagons, because they are one of the most obvious icons of this period, when settlers moved west in ever-growing numbers. These wagons have their origin in the East, in colonial times, 17th and 18th centuries. Roads and paths were underdeveloped and uh, Heavy loads had to be carried around in uh, colonial America and Canada. At the time of the Independence War, and still in the 19th century, there was a specific design in the eastern United States and Canada called the Conestoga wagon, which was large and heavy and could carry up to six tons. It was drawn by horses or oxen. The typical covered wagon of the American West is a lighter design and evolution of these Conestoga wagons because they would have been far too heavy for the variety of landforms and uh, climates they would have to cross. Lighter covered wagons could also be drawn by a single animal, ox or horse, which was yet another advantage. So, thanks to their reliability, the shelter they offered in case of rain or snow, and their affordability too, covered wagons became very widely used, from the Great Plains to the West Coast. They gained the nickname Prairie Schooner, and they could have different sizes or shapes, but generally, Overland migrants fitted the wagon with five or six bows of wood or metal that arched high over the bed, and uh, over this they stretched cloth. The picture of covered wagons traveling across the plains, the deserts or the mountains, alone or in group, with their white cloth like the sails of a ship crossing the sea. This was an instant hit in engravings or photography, and later in films. 
so they became a romantic symbol of the American West in the past 150 years. But contrary to the typical wagon in westerns, most of the time they were drawn by oxen rather than horses, because it was more reliable, less expensive, and almost as fast. Progressively, covered wagons disappeared as a mean of transportation, with the arrival of railroads and later, of course, motorized vehicles. But for decades they remained familiar from the Midwest to the Pacific coast. And it is in this context that the Donner Party left Illinois for California. The journey was expected to last month and be exhausting, especially for all the members of the group. James Reed's mother-in-law, who was coming along, was 70, and indeed she passed away just a few weeks after departure. But overall the migrants were optimistic, they were curious and happy about the new life that awaited them or so they thought. The beginning of the journey went well. The destination for the first leg of their journey was Independence, Missouri, which was 250 miles west of Springfield. Nowadays Independence has more than 100,000 inhabitants, but in the 1840s it was a frontier town, a big village, that was booming thanks to the business of outfitting pioneers. Like other towns on or close to the Missouri River, it was at the start of the route to the west, like the California Trail or the Oregon Trail. We will come back to this later. The Donner Reed Group reached independence in a month, in May 1846 and made its last preparations for a journey through the Wild West that was expected to last four to a maximum of six months, meaning that they should have arrived in California at some point in fall and uh, traveled during spring and summer. Within a week of leaving Independence, the Donners and the Reeds, with their nine wagons, joined a larger group of 50 wagons that was following the same trail. And despite minor problems that were to be expected, like rain and a rising river, they advanced according to plan. By mid-June, a month after leaving Independence, they had traveled 450 miles, and their next destination was Fort Laramie in Wyoming. This fort was a trading post founded ten years earlier, through which many trains of pioneers transited on their way to the west. It was located just before a long climb to the Rocky Mountains, and the trail that passed through Fort Laramie led to South Pass which was known as the best point to cross the mountains because it was the lowest point. The party crossed the Rocky Mountains, following the established trail. Their next destination should now have been Fort Hall, north of the Great Salt Lake, after which the trail they followed splitted. One route to Oregon went to the northwest, and another route, the California Trail, went to the southwest. Looking at a map, the safer, already explored trail was not the most direct. It went north to what would become the state of Idaho, then south through Nevada. At the time, these trails for migrants were still recent. They had been explored and established in the 1830s. 
and there were still trail guides and explorers looking for shortcuts or routes that would be easier to travel. One such man, called Lansford Hastings, had explored an alternative route south of the Great Salt Lake through Utah to Great Salt Lake Desert before rejoining the established California Trail. To publicize his shortcut and offer his services as a trail guide, Hastings left letters and signs along the Pioneer's route, and he sent riders to distribute letters to traveling migrants. He tried to attract travelers to an alternative trading post, Fort Bridger, where his cutoff began. By mid-July, the large train that the Donners and the Reeds were a part of had received at his letters. They promised them to shorten their journey to California by more than 300 miles, and some people were interested, but others were more cautious, or were headed to Oregon in any case and uninterested in a shortcut to California. So the wagon train split it. The majority of it opted to follow the established trail via Fort Hall, and the minority decided to explore the possibility of the shortcut and went south to the alternative trading post for Bridger, from where they would be able to either take the shortcut or return to the regular trail. The group had relatively heavy wagons and many children, more than others, which made it less apt to travel through rough terrain, and what they couldn't know was that the Hastings shortcut was very far from the smooth route they had been promised. It was indeed shorter, but also harder to travel. A journalist who was also traveling on the trail and had a bit of advance, tried to warn them to avoid it at all costs, but the letter he left for them at Fort Bridger never reached the group. In reality, Fort Bridger was privately owned, and its owner hoped that the Hastings cutoff would become a regular part of the trail to California, because this would have meant much more business for him with the growing waves of pioneers. So when they reached Fort Bridger, they were advised to try the shortcut and to head south of the Great Salt Lake through the Wasatch Mountains, where Hastings claimed there was a, an easy passage. The truth was that at this moment in time, in 1846, no wagon train had ever crossed the southern part of the Salt Lake Desert. Only a few men with no wagons and no children. At this point, there were 89 people in the party, and it needed a leader. This is when it became officially the Donner Party. George Donner was a mature and experienced man who was appreciated for his peaceful character, he was chosen. Apart from the Donner and Reed families, there were several other families that had joined the train since departure from Independence and decided to go south to Fort Bridger and the shortcut when the large group had splitted a few days earlier. The crossing of the Wasatch Mountains turned out to be much more complicated than promised, and it made the party lose 18 days, which was concerning because they had to arrive to California before the winter. There were still hundreds of miles of uh, mountainous or desertic land to cross, and these regions would become extremely cold and inhospitable in the winter. 
In total, the months of August was spent to cover a very small distance and reach the Great Salt Lake Desert. The crossing of the desert was yet another ordeal for the Donner Party. In the heat of the day, the moisture underneath the salt crust rose to the surface and made it gummy. The wagon wheels sank into it, water was nearly gone, and uh, the days were terribly hot, whereas the cold at night was uh, hard to bear. During the crossing of the salt desert, that took six days instead of the two that had been promised, several oxen were lost and had to be abandoned. And the little remaining faith the migrants had in the shortcut completely vanished. But they kept advancing. They reached springs on the other side of the desert where they could recover and uh, continue their journey. They finally rejoined the regular California Trail on September 26, two months after embarking on the so-called cutoff. The shortcut had delayed them by probably a full month. The summer was now over, and they were still hundreds of miles ahead. Each year, Starting in spring and over the summer, thousands of pioneers crossed to the west. And time was very important, because they could not afford to be trapped by the winter. All other wagon trains for 1846 were now well ahead, or had already arrived at their destination. The Donner Party was at the back of the queue. It was slow and already late, and this was really concerning. But what are these trails followed by pioneers exactly? There had been explorers on land in North America since the 16th century. But for a long time, until the late 18th century, most colonization, except in Mexico and Central America, was limited to the coastlines and uh, islands. There were not uh, that many settlers interested in uh, traveling far inland in uh, unknown and sometimes hostile regions. This changed dramatically in the 19th century, when the Great Plains and the West Coast received wave after wave of uh, emigrants from the eastern United States or directly from Europe. The rush to the west coast, to California in particular, really began in the 1840s. It was fueled by sometimes poor living conditions and always by the hope of a better life, freedom, a new start, wealth. In the 1850s, this accelerated even more with the California gold rush when gold was discovered. This would happen a few years after the Donner Party. So various routes for migrants that could be crossed by people and their wagons were explored and formed networks that served all along the 19th century, even after the construction of railroads. They declined, but they were still used. There were two major groups of trails. One that typically started in Missouri, especially the Oregon Trail, the California Trail and the Mormon Trail. They were one single route and they separated depending on the destination. The Mormon Trail was shorter, as it ended in Utah and implied a three months journey. On these three trails, historians estimate that at least half a million emigrants traveled to the West in 25 years, when uh, they were the main alternative between 1843 and 1869. 
another group of routes to California started in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And these were southern routes that ended in South California. There was the Southern Trail that followed the modern frontier with Mexico through Arizona, or the Old Spanish Trail, also from Santa Fe but more northern through Colorado, Utah and Nevada. The Southern Trail would be used all year round but was uh, as hard as the others because of the deserts and uh, the mountains it uh, had to cross. For the Donner Party, by the end of September, the situation was serious but not desperate. They had been able to return to the regular California Trail without losing any man, only animals and material in their disastrous attempt to use the shortcut. But the worst was still to come. It was late in the year now. They were alone on the trail and no other group, no other train wagon was following them. There were tensions in the party that had accumulated during the hardships of the past weeks. And things did not improve. The party began to split into smaller groups centered on the families. They met Native Americans who joined them for a short time and raised hope that they could find assistance in these mountains where each day became colder. But after a couple of days, the natives stole or shot several oxen and disappeared. A prominent member of the party, James Reed, the head of the Reed family, was involved in a fight and stabbed a young man to death, after which he was banished from the party and left alone. He agreed to go ahead and try to reach the Sacramento Valley in California to find supplies and come back to rescue the party. It was now well into October, and they still had a stretch of desert ahead, followed by uh, an even more formidable obstacle. Before the central valley of California, the Sierra Nevada, another high mountain range with peaks above 14,000 feet. Until the Hastings cut off, the whole party had uh, traveled peacefully and families uh, helped each other, which was key to the survival of uh, the weakest, including uh, elderly and children. In October, the party disintegrated. There was less and less grass on the way to feed horses and oxen, so the animals began to weaken. And, uh, more and more were stolen by the natives because they had to spread on a larger rear to feed. Several wagons were lost and the women or elders were asked to walk because other families didn't want to take them on their wagons and weaken their own animals even more with a heavier load. Because he could no longer walk a 70-year-old was abandoned near a stream and probably died there, alone in the wild. The priority was now to reach and cross the Sierra Nevada as quickly as possible, because their last resources in food were disappearing fast, and the first snow was expected any day. They finally reached a pass, now called the Donner Pass, on October 20, or more exactly the first families of the company reached it, because they now advanced separately. They had been told that the pass would not be snowed before mid-November, so hope of crossing the Sierra Nevada remained, because it gave them about 20 days. But luck was not on their side. 
Further down the trail, they began to find snow drifts. And this year, the first snow arrived on October 28, hiding the trail under a vast white blanket. Over the following days, several more attempts to bridge the pass with wagons and animals were made, but they all failed. Winter was now starting, at the beginning of November, and the various families, scattered over several miles, tried to establish camp. The donors built tents, other families found very rudimentary cabins near a lake that they tried to improve, as a storm that lasted a week began to rage. They were stuck, alone, the temperatures were now falling quickly, and food was very scarce. With little experience of the wilderness, they were not able to efficiently hunt or fish in the lake. Their provisions quickly ended, and they had to resort to eating the last oxen that were now starving and freezing. Half to two-thirds of the migrants were children. Once meat had disappeared, ox and horse bones were boiled to make soup, until they became so brittle that they disintegrated. A week later, children began to boil or roast leather to eat it. Some of the men died, including Jacob Donner, and his brother too, the nominal leader of the party, George Donner, who had an injury to his hand that had become infected. In January 1847, death by starvation, cold or disease was taking people almost every day. On the other side of the Sierra Nevada, the fate of the Donner Party was not entirely unknown. James Reed, the banished member for murder, had managed to cross and tried to return to the party with supplies. There were also other migrants who had uh, traveled with these uh, same families earlier, before splitting when they decided to try the Hastings cutoff and they warned that the Donner Party was probably still a prisoner of the snow, somewhere along the California Trail. To make things even more complicated, the war between Mexico and the United States was raging. There were sporadic fights in California, and it was not a large-scale conflict, but it made it more difficult to organize and send a rescue party. Finally, three groups marched east in February and March and reached the remains of the Donner Party with food and blankets. Out of almost 90 people, half had died, and the survivors were in terrible condition. A rumor appeared that they had to resort to cannibalism to survive. This is actually very uncertain. Many survivors disputed this claim, and it has never been proven beyond doubt. In any case, the children, women and men who survived the ordeal all remained traumatized by these long weeks of waiting, tortured by hunger, and the cold, from November to March, with close to no hope of being rescued. 89 people had left Fort Bridger in July 1846, and only 48 escaped the snow of the Sierra Nevada. The story of the Donner Party quickly reached the rest of the United States. It appeared in newspapers in 1847, and together with the war, 
It contributed to a temporary decrease in the number of pioneers on the westward trails. But this didn't last long, and the migration by land to the west coast never ceased. The survivors settled in California, and the last of them, who were children at the time of the disaster, died in the early 20th century. Mortality was very different depending on ages and genders. The highest mortality rate was among men above 20 years, which is attributed to a combination of behavior and metabolism. Men tended to take on the riskiest tasks and venture more outside the shelters. There were other reasons too. Adult men tend to have less body fat than women and metabolize proteins faster. The highest mortality rate was among single men, probably because they didn't have a family to share food with and they didn't own cattle. Infants also had a high mortality rate, obviously, because they were more fragile. The survival rate of women was higher And another group that had a higher chance of survival was children between 6 and 14. Because until the end, these people tried to keep them alive. They may have lost a lot of their ability to socialize, as the disintegration of the party shows in the last month. But they kept taking care of their children, and their sacrifice was uh, not in vain because the majority of them survived until they were rescued. The Donner Party is remembered as the most spectacular tragedy for pioneers in the record of American westward migration, which was dangerous and made many victims, but never as many on a single episode. And now, for our second story of the night, we're going to move to the other side of North America and explore Oak Island in Nova Scotia. Oak Island is a fairly small island in Canada that has attracted a lot of interest from treasure hunters since the 19th century. It has acquired a reputation for hiding a fabulous treasure and maybe even ancient artifacts from the Holy Grail to Shakespearean manuscripts. There is even a rumor of a curse saying that seven men will die in the search for the treasure before it is found. To date, Six men have died looking for it. But first, let's take a look at where we are now and what this mystery is about. Oak Island is a part of the Canadian province of Nova Scotia on the Atlantic and it is fairly easy to access because it is located just 200 meters about 650 feet from shore. It is even connected to the mainland by a causeway that was built in the 1960s. It is relatively cold, like the climate of Nova Scotia, and parts are covered with the kind of forest you find in the southeast of Canada or in New England. But with a humid climate and the effects of the ocean, it can be hidden in fog regularly, as many as three months a year. Occasionally there are also powerful storms and hurricanes. The island is quite small, at 140 acres, and it doesn't have a permanent population. Long before the arrival of Europeans, 
The region was populated by natives, especially the Mi'kmaq. For several thousand years, they have had a presence in the overall area. The earliest European residents in the bay around the island were fishermen from France in the 1750s. The waters around Nova Scotia and Newfoundland attracted many West European fishermen in the 17th and 18th centuries because they were extremely rich in fish. Following the Seven Years' War, the French descending residents of Nova Scotia and New Brunswick were expulsed and the local government encouraged settlement of the area by other colonists from New England especially. In the 1760s, new settlers arrived from Massachusetts and Oak Island was officially divided into lots that became privately owned by various families. Since then, the island has remained privately owned and has changed hands many times. It was bought intermittently by treasure hunters. Because in reality, its reputation started appearing more than 200 years ago. And for as many years, parties have traveled to the island to start all sorts of searches. So much that the causeway to the mainland was built in 1965 in order to easily bring heavy machinery. How did it begin exactly? It is hard to know because the earliest accounts of treasure hunts began in the 1790s, but they left no written trace and are known only by word of mouth. The first stories to appear in print are from 1857, several decades after rumors about a treasure on Oak Island began to spread, which gave a lot of time for these stories to change, to be amplified or forgotten. The original story by early settlers, tales of a dying member from the crew of a famous pirate, Captain Kidd, who would have stated on his deathbed that a treasure worth two million pounds had been buried on the island. Captain Kidd, William Kidd, was a Scottish sailor from the 17th century. He was tried and executed for piracy. You couldn't find exploits or spectacular feats in his career. There are none, and he didn't become famous as a brilliant pirate. Some historians even consider that he was unjustly tried for piracy. His legend appeared because of a belief that he had left buried treasures in various places. Oak Island is one of them, but there are more. There are also stories about other treasures in Long Island or Suffolk County, New York, three more in Connecticut, and yet another one in Canada, in the Bay of Fundy. As far as we know, none of them has ever been retrieved. But these uh, rumors inspired many accounts and uh, novels like Treasure Island by Stevenson, and so formed the legend of Captain Kidd, the treasure hider, who was executed before he could return to unearth his riches. The locals had heard about these stories of a pirate treasure on Oak Island, and in 1799, a man looking for a location for a farm on the island would have found a depression in the ground where earth was loose, not hard packed as the surrounding soil. With the help of others, he would have started digging down to 30 feet, but the story doesn't say whether he found anything. 
Apparently he didn't, because he didn't become richer after this. Other parties in the first half of the 19th century dug shafts, but after a while they were all flooded with seawater. In one of these pits, in 1802, a large stone inscribed with symbols was allegedly discovered 90 feet below the surface. The stone disappeared in the 19th century, if it ever existed, because some people claimed it was just a rumor, or that it had been fabricated in the chimney of a nearby house. Others claimed that the symbols were just accidental scratches. But the stone became a famous object in the community of Oak Island enthusiasts. One researcher in the 20th century claimed that the supposed cipher on it translated as 40 feet below, 2 million pounds lie buried. But this information is not substantiated and uh, the stone is nowhere to be found nowadays. In any case, this era of rumors and word of mouth ended in 1857 when the first articles about treasure hunting on Oak Island appeared in the local press. For years it remained known essentially locally, but this was enough to draw more and more people to the island, and this time with bigger teams and boring equipment or steam pumps to try and keep water out of the shafts. Oak Island raises only 11 meters, that's 30 to 40 feet above the sea level, and the island is rather small. The exact mechanism is not fully understood, but shafts that are more than 10 to 15 meters deep or more tend to be flooded with seawater, which the treasure hunters understood quickly because the level of water in the shafts changed with the tides. Several different campaigns succeeded one another on the island for decades, all of them based on digging around the initial pit where a depression had been found decades earlier, or in other parts of the island. They almost all were abandoned after a few years with no conclusive result, even though the boreholes became even wider and deeper. The original pit had been nicknamed the Money Pit, even though no discovery of money or artifacts that would indicate the presence of a treasure were unearthed as far as we know. But despite the absence of finds, down and around the money pit, it kept attracting treasure hunters and investors, because there is something weird about it indeed. First, the earth it contains is uh, definitely looser than the soil of the island, which suggests that it was dug first and refilled later. Second, remains of wood that could have been platforms at various levels of depth were unearthed down the pit. It is actually not established that these were platforms, but their presence underground is hard to explain if the hole was not artificial. And it is puzzling to see the pit fill with seawater so easily because it is not located on the beach and it looks almost as if the, the island was floating on water. So this mystery kept attracting more people and maybe also the legend around the island itself because when so many parties have explored it for more than a century it is hard to believe that there would be absolutely nothing so Oak Island was never short of treasure hunters and its mystery attracted 
high-profile investors over time. The most famous of them is probably Franklin Delano Roosevelt, long before he became President of the United States. He started to be interested in Oak Island in 1909. In the previous century, his grandfather had financed searches on the island, and even though he never went, he kept following any new development in the mystery until his death in 1945. There were also high-profile actors like John Wayne or Errol Flynn, who invested in treasure digs. With time, a lot of theories formed about how the pit appeared, how it was formed, and what it may contain. Some of them try to explain it naturally, and others defend the uh, hypothesis that it would be man-made, and uh, speculate on what it could have contained. The leading explanation that excludes human intervention, and uh, in that case probably uh, excludes the presence of a treasure, is that the pit would be uh, just a natural sinkhole, there would be limestone layers under it that water would have dissolved, making the ground collapse long ago. And then the sinkhole would have been progressively filled up with debris over a long period of time, which would explain the wood buried inside, together with dust and soil, making it look man-made. In support of this theory, it matches the geology of the area. There's a number of sinkholes connected to natural underground caves on the mainland near the island. Apart from the hypothesis that it is just a natural phenomenon, a lot of enthusiasts have suggested that it was a treasure trove and emitted possibilities about what it could contain. In general, these are more claims than theories, because they are not based on any document, so scientifically they have no substance. They are not technically impossible, but a skeptic would argue that these treasures or artifacts could as well be anywhere else, since nothing connects them to Oak Island. Apart from Captain Kidd, the original story from the beginnings, there is another famous pirate mentioned, Blackbeard, and then all sorts of people who could have wanted to hide a treasure. The Knights Templar, even though it sounds a bit outlandish, because when the order of the Knights Templar was dissolved in the Middle Ages, the only Europeans who had a knowledge of the existence of America were the Vikings, and they certainly ignored how large this continent was. So imagining that, for some reason, the Knights Templar knew about America and how to get there, but kept the secret, this requires a lot of imagination and taste for conspiracies. In the same category, the treasure would have belonged to the Freemasons, and here the timeline works better, but this is also unsubstantiated. Still in the same group of outlandish claims, it would be a site where the Incas would have hidden a treasure to protect it from the Spaniards. The Incas lived thousands of miles away in South America, as you know, and nothing indicates that they ever reached Canada or were just aware of the existence of lands so far north. There are other claims that look more reasonable because they would make historical sense. That it would have been dug by Spanish sailors to hold the treasure from a wrecked galleon, or by engineers from the French army during the Seven Years' War to hide the treasury of the fortress of Louisbourg in Nova Scotia after British forces captured the fortress. Yet another one is that the hole would be 
British and dug to hide loot taken during the invasion of Cuba or during the American Revolution. The problem with all these theories is that they don't really rely on any testimony or archives. They cannot be invalidated. They don't explain why the diggers did not leave any other trace on the island. And uh, ultimately no treasure was uh, ever found down the pit to uh, validate these theories. Unless there was indeed a treasure, but it fell down to underground caves before or during excavation works, and the treasure would now be uh, much deeper underground. And with the growing legend of Oak Island, even more claims were made in the 20th century about what it could hide. This time, not just a treasure, but historical or mythological artifacts. The jewels of Marie Antoinette, the Queen of France during the French Revolution. Many of them disappeared. Or manuscripts that are connected to the theory that William Shakespeare didn't write the works he was credited for. Instead, it would be a philosopher Francis Bacon, and the proof on manuscripts would have been hidden on Oak Island. And then there are a few other claims, like the Ark of the Covenant or the Holy Grail, often connected to the Knights Templar. So is there anything of financial or historical value on Oak Island? I don't know, but at this point maybe the most interesting uh, element and tangible thing about it is the phenomenon itself that has been uh, developing around the island for more than 200 years. The legend of Oak Island feeds itself. It takes shape because there's a constant flow of treasure hunters and now tourists and TV shows that keep coming and uh, they keep the myth alive and give it substance at the same time. It has become hard to rule out the possibility that there is something because that would mean that several generations have absurdly spent a lot of time, of energy and money for nothing. And yet, when you look for hard evidence, there is almost nothing to it. It's all dubious artifacts that go missing before they can be studied, like the stone with inscriptions I talked about before, or second-hand oral testimonies, or claims that look like the product of imagination rather than investigation. So Oak Island looks like a modern iteration of the El Dorado, the land or the city of gold that the first Spanish conquistadors looked for. It may just be a creation of the mind, but it is impossible to assert that there is nothing, and it is tempting to entertain the idea that maybe the next hole will reveal something, and Oak Island will suddenly appear to be everything generations have uh, dreamt of, or maybe even more. For our third story of the night, we are going to take a look at another elusive mystery that may be in the process of being forgotten right now, because it was probably much more famous a few decades ago, the Bermuda Triangle. What is it? It is hard to say what the limits of the Bermuda Triangle are, because the area is loosely defined. It is a large region of the Atlantic Ocean that is often represented as a triangle between Bermuda, the south of Florida, and Puerto Rico. In the 1950s, it is not that old, Various press articles started to point unusual disappearances of ships or aircrafts in uh, this region under mysterious circumstances. 
more and more writers got involved in this, from pulp magazines and newspapers to book writers. And in a few years, the concept of a mysterious sea region where unexplainable phenomena happen became well known and very popular. It peaked in the 1960s and 1970s. Since then, the term Bermuda Triangle has remained very famous, but there is a lack of incidents to keep the mystery and the public interest alive. And another problem is that the region of the Triangle is heavily travelled. There are plenty of shipping lanes in its vicinity between Europe, North America and the Caribbean. Cruise ships cross it. Hundreds of planes fly over it every week. And as we speak, there are probably dozens of ships travelling within the limits of the Triangle and no one doubts that they can do it safely. So it is hard to sustain the theory that something weird, unexplained, is happening in this area, in this context, when nothing out of the ordinary seems to be happening for such a long time. But it doesn't mean that the concept of the triangle appeared out of nowhere. It was based on a collection of incidents that are hard to explain. In total, about 30 are recorded since the 19th century. So let's take a look at some of the most noticeable. There were various ships lost in the region in the 19th century and before, but not particularly more than in other maritime regions so the waters south of Bermuda did not particularly draw attention. 20th century incidents are more significant and better documented. Chronologically, the first major incident in the 20th century is a tragedy that happened long before the 1950s, the unexplained disappearance of the USS Cyclops in 1918. The USS Cyclops was a large collier, a ship built to transport coal and other mining products like ore. It belonged to the US Navy. The ship departed the island of Barbados with a load of manganese ore and suddenly went missing without a trace, including a crew of 309 people. Nothing was ever discovered, no wreck, not a single body, as if the ship had suddenly vanished at an unknown location. The reason for this remains mysterious today, even though several explanations are possible. It could be because of a storm, or the ship could have been sunk by a German submarine. In March 1918, the First World War was still raging. Or it could be the consequence of an overload that would have broken the ship or threatened its balance, because later, in the Second World War, two sister ships of the Cyclops that also carried similar heavy metallic loads were lost in the Atlantic. And it may have something to see with a structural failure. But in any case, the disappearance of the USS Cyclops remains unexplained. Three years later, in 1921, a large schooner with five masts, the Deering, was found totally abandoned and hard aground on the coast of North Carolina. What happened to the crew is a, a mystery. The ship's log and the navigation equipment were gone, along with the crew's personal effects and the two lifeboats. It seems the ship was abandoned suddenly, but no one ever reappeared to tell what happened. To this day, this remains one of the great maritime mysteries in history. There are possible explanations, here again, 
that are not based on the supernatural, like a mutiny or piracy, but no definitive answer. And the wreck of the D-ring is another unexplained element that appeared near the Bermuda Triangle that would be imagined 30 years later. And then, nothing noticeable happened until 1945, 24 years later, with an even stranger incident, the disappearance of Flight 19. Flight 19 was a training flight of five bombers in December of that year, just months after the end of the Second World War. The goal of this training flight was to fly over water over 350 miles from Fort Lauderdale in Florida to the east, then to the north and back to base to complete the exercise. Some time after takeoff, radio contact with the five planes was lost simultaneously, and worries mounted when the Air Force realized that they didn't come back, none of them. A bigger patrol bomber with a 13-man crew was deployed to look for them on the route they should have taken above the Bermuda Triangle. It also disappeared. Maybe the rescue flight exploded because a tanker of the coast of Florida reported seeing an explosion and this model of patrol bombers had a history of explosions due to uh, vapor leaks. The crew of 13 died or disappeared on top of the 14 men aboard the five bombers of Flight 19. It looks almost impossible that they disappeared due to a mechanical issue. There were five different planes and the probability that they all went down at the same time is almost zero. So maybe it could have been errors of navigation leading to the aircrafts running out of fuel, but no fully satisfactory and proven technical explanation ever surfaced. And then it accelerated. Two years later, in January 1948, a passenger flight to Bermuda disappeared above the ocean without a trace. In December of the same year, another airliner with 32 people on board disappeared on a flight from Puerto Rico to Miami. There was never enough information to uh, determine probable cause of the disappearance. A few weeks later, in January 1949, yet again another aircraft for passengers went missing on a flight from Bermuda to Jamaica. This accumulation of disappearances in 1948 and 1949, even though they could be attributed to uh, mechanical problems or navigation errors, that would have caused a, a lack of fuel, for example, were connected to Flight 19 from 1945, to the mysteries of the USS Cyclops in 1918 and the D-Ring in 1921, plus various other smaller incidents. And all of this inspired the first article on mysterious disappearances of ships and aircrafts that was published in the Miami Herald in 1950. Five years later, a pleasure yacht was found adrift in the Atlantic, south of Bermuda. The crew was missing. A hurricane that passed nearby a few days before. But why would the crew have evacuated a boat that was not sinking and was retrieved in good condition? to embark on a much smaller lifeboat. It does not seem to make uh, much sense, and this mystery was never explained either. And finally, in 1963, two large refueling aircrafts of the uh, US Air Force collided and crashed into the Atlantic, 
300 miles west of Bermuda. Surprisingly, it looked like there were two different crash sites, as if the planes had exploded separately, without contact. But it appeared after closer examination that what looked like a second crash site on the surface of the ocean was probably in fact just a mass of seaweed and driftwood. Since the 1960s, no new major unexplained incidents have happened. There has been a number of ships sunk by hurricanes or small plane accidents, but nothing as hard to explain as the earlier incidents of the 20th century. And this is probably why the Bermuda Triangle is less discussed today. But even though the number of enthusiasts about this mystery has decreased, it quickly became an element of pop culture, and many books of fiction or investigation were written about it, with all sorts of explanations, natural or not. In a sense, it doesn't make the study of the triangle easier, because many incidents were embellished at that time, or inaccurately reported. I tried to eliminate these ones, the most dubious ones, from the list I told you about. So first there are paranormal explanations, and they are quite colorful. Some of them pin the blame on ancient leftover technology from Atlantis, the mythical lost continent that is generally located in the Atlantic Ocean, somewhere between Europe, Africa and America. Another explanation, which was particularly popular in the 1950s and 1960s, attributed the events to UFOs, or more broadly to extraterrestrials. In fact, these explanations tend to replace a strange or mysterious phenomenon with a much bigger mystery. So in a sense they don't really explain, they make things more uncertain, more complicated. But they're attractive for the thrill and the excitement they provide. As the Bermuda Triangle craze was rising, more critical authors examined the collection of incidents and came up with more natural possible explanations. First by arguing that many incidents had been exaggerated and located within the triangle even though they may have happened nearby or even quite far from it, that the area was very large and that, with this in mind, the number of ships and aircrafts reported missing in the area was quite similar, proportionally, to any other part of the ocean. And indeed, insurance premiums for ships crossing the Triangle are no different to what they are for other maritime regions, because there is no excess sinistrality. We can probably trust insurance companies to take the real data into account. A possible natural explanation to some of the disappearances is the frequency of hurricanes, which in fact are powerful and destructive in this area. A lot of incidents can also be attributed to human error or technical flaws, which is an indirect human error. But a less common natural phenomenon could also take place under the waters of the triangle on the continental shelves underwater. There are large fields of methane, and it is believed that bubbles of gas that would leak could possibly put in difficulty or even sink a ship on the surface. They decrease the density of the water and may be able to uh, literally uh, suck a ship under the water, and then the powerful current that flows across the triangle, the Gulf Stream, could quickly disperse the wreckage. For all of these reasons, 
most reputable sources like uh, physicists and uh, marine and weather scientists dismiss the idea that there is any mystery and conclude that the Bermuda Triangle is an embellished journalistic and fictional creation. But it is still uh, well known. And even though every single incident can be explained, many of them are still puzzling. There may not be enough of them to consider that the Bermuda Triangle is a place where a broader, unexplained phenomenon exists, statistically. But the incidents we know of still are really mysterious. So this is all for tonight. I hope you enjoyed this new batch of stories. There are many more you can discover or listen to again in my library. I'll put a link to a playlist in the description. It is now time for you to let go and fall asleep or pick another story if you stay. The sweet sound of the rain is now going to accompany you for a little while. Sleep well. Sweet dreams. <laughs>